Okay, uh, maybe we can get started. Uh, so uh, I'm very glad to see a full house today for uh, this very special lecture, the ICTS Distinguished Lecture. Uh, so welcome everyone to ICTS, uh, program participants and others. Uh, so the ICTS Distinguished Lecture is, uh, is one of our flag flagship lectures uh, and delivered by an eminent scientist. Uh, and uh, we've had a long uh, list of uh, uh, eminent scientists, uh, just even in the past year, we've had uh, David Nelson, Eduardo Fradkin, uh, and uh, Nick Kaiser, uh, various uh, uh, people giving this lecture, and before that, Giorgio Parisi, uh, Joel Lebowitz, uh, David Gross, many people. So, uh, so it's in this series, it's a pleasure to uh, have uh, uh, Professor Sasha Migdal uh, giving the lecture this year uh, in this meeting as part of this meeting. Uh, and uh, it's uh, personally a very uh, a privilege to introduce him because uh, he was my teacher in graduate school. Uh, 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 so Sasha uh, did his uh, PhD from the legendary Landau Institute for Theoretical Physics in the late 60s, and uh, even then, uh, I think uh, uh, at a very young age with uh, Sasha Polyakov, I think uh, they really, uh, I think, altered the physics in the Soviet Union, uh, which was uh, dominated by Landau. And uh, uh, afterwards, I think it was thanks to Sasha and uh, both the Sashas, Polyakov and Migdal, that uh, uh, that field theory sort of uh, really took off, uh, uh, especially at the Landau Institute, leading to many wonderful developments in the uh, 70s and 80s. Uh, so, and uh, uh, Sasha was personally instrumental in many of these things, uh, starting with early work with Polyakov on dynamical mass generation in gauge theories. And uh, later, the, maybe many of you know the textbook material, McDowell Kadanoff uh, 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 approach to renormalization group, uh, the, um, uh, the, the conformal bootstrap, which uh, again with Polyakov, uh, which has uh, been again uh, resuscitated in recent times and has led to uh, a remarkable understanding even of the 3D Ising model. Um, so, and then, uh, so there's a long list of uh, uh, scientific uh, achievements of uh, Sasha I could go on with, uh, but I'll just restrict to uh, uh, two more around the, uh, the equations governing Wilson loops in gauge theories with uh, Yuri Makenko um, and uh, the description of matrix models of two dimensional gravity with David Gross uh, and uh, simultaneously other groups. Um, uh, so, uh, but Sasha is not just a remarkable physicist. Uh, he uh, uh, has led a very interesting life, uh, many lives, in so to say. Uh, so he, after uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, he moved to the US and he was at Princeton uh, till 1996. And that's when I had the good fortune of taking some of his courses on field theory and uh, also interacting with him on two topics which were in my thesis, which were part of the minor things that uh, Sasha had contributed to, uh, namely the idea of a master field in gauge theories and also in 2D Yang-Mills theories. Uh, so, um, so it was a privilege to discuss uh, with him uh, on some of these topics at that time. Uh, but in 1996, he actually left academia to uh, become an inventor, an entrepreneur, and uh, he has uh, uh, since then worked in many interesting things, and I won't go into a list of that uh, in imaging, and has, I think, about nearly a dozen patents uh, and uh, several startup companies. I think now he is into uh, his fourth startup company, the Migdal Research. Uh, uh, but at the same time, I think, his passion for physics has not died, and uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he has been thinking about uh, the loop equations in the context of fluid dynamics for a very long time. I think today we heard from Luca from 1994, uh, but so 30 years later, and uh, uh, today we will be hearing him, and currently he is affiliated with 
NYU Abu Dhabi, not very far from us. Uh, and uh, so hopefully we'll have, we'll see more of Sasha. Uh, but uh, with that introduction uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Sasha, let me invite him to deliver the uh, ICTS Distinguished Lecture on Loop Equations in uh, Decaying Turbulence. And uh, before that, there's a small little uh, a small little ceremony for which I would invite uh, Professor Srinivasan as a memento to be uh, given to uh, Sasha. Sasha, please. Uh, um, uh, for uh, this is a memento on behalf of ICTS, uh, which has a. Come around <laughs> in case somebody is taking a picture. A picture there. <laughs> It has a sandalwood Buddha a statue. The sa oh. a sandalwood is a very special wood. Okay, from, thank you, uh, thank here, you. An aromatic wood. Uh, so, would I say a sentence? Sure. So we knew that uh, Rajesh has soft corner for Sasha Migdal. So when we were proposing this meeting, we enticed him into um, being uh, very favorable to this meeting by. Uh, planting Sasha Migdal in front of Rajesh. And that's how it made, it became easier for the program to be approved. So thank you very much for your hospitality and everything. And uh, Sasha, of course, deserves this honor. You are bestowing upon him. Uh, Sasha, it's all yours. Thank you. Well, it sounded like a final words, uh, but I'm very much alive and I'm planning to stay alive indefinitely. And I'm just warming up with my work. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. It's the second time. And uh, I see a lot of progress, both in quantity and quality of theoretical physicists and their devotion and enthusiasm. And that's exactly why I came here for. I want to inspire some young uh, people, because all people are too busy with their stuff. I'm talking about younger people or those who are young uh, inside, like Srini, for example. So I'm inviting, uh, I want to invite young researchers to study new fascinating field, which is uh, intersection between field theory and uh, turbulence, which uh, is what I was doing for the last few years. Moreover, I mean, I've been doing it maybe 30 years. Anyway, so I skip that. After. So the turbulence problem looks deceptively simple. Find the limit of the solution of Navier-Stokes equation when the viscosity goes to zero at fixed energy dissipation rate. Uh, very simple equation. Just solve it. Here is the equation itself. That's incompressibility condition and. Uh, it's slightly unusual way of writing this equation. I just moved some terms under gradient because the gradient will later drop. Uh, but that's equivalent to it's conventional. In this limit, when viscosity goes to zero, the Navier-Stokes equation tends to the Euler equation everywhere, except some singular regions, vortex sheets and vortex lines, where large viscosity gradients could compensate the factor of nu. So naively, you would set nu equals zero and get what is called Euler equation, but we all know that you cannot uh, uh, safely set zero coefficients in front of highest derivative in your equation because there are always domains with high gradients which would compensate that. These domains are known of turbulence, of course. For example, the domain, I mean, the, um, the, the turbulent layers uh, near walls, and there are many other examples, vortex tubes, which Luca Mariconi told about today, and vortex sheets. It's very well known that the essence of the turbulence is that there are all these viscous structures with high viscosity where the energy dissipates. So you cannot safely put viscosity, and the question is to find out what exactly happens. So these regions, um, of high vorticity are randomly distributed in space, making velocity and vorticity stochastic variables at every point, with local vorticity values divergent in the turbulence limit. So if you want a qualitative picture, it's the following. Imagine the uh, uh, soup with 
little noodles of of the vortex strings and some blobs maybe, but mostly noodles and and pancakes because um, the vertices structures which are fully three dimensional don't dissipate fast enough. The vertices structures uh, which are tube like as is found by burgers have dissipation which is in, uh, inversely proportional to new omega squared, the square of vertices. That's why dissipation stays finite. And vortex sheets have slower, smaller dissipation, but still they contribute. So in the mm, limit of zero small viscosity, you are left with lots of singular structures randomly distributed. And here is the origin of randomness, in my opinion. I think it is shared by many of you. The origin of randomness or stochasticity is the following, that these vortex structures, each of them produces long tail of so-called Biot-Savar velocity, which is decreasing as a power. So at any given point, all these vortex structures all over the volume are contributing to the background velocity by, uh, by their uh, uh, Biot-Savar integrals. It's like a dipole moment. So at any given point, there is a lot of uh, random contributions from different places, and this makes it a Gaussian random variable. So the velocity would be random. And that random velocity would move uh, this vorticity because vorticity structures are frozen into the flow. So this random velocity, self-generated random velocity is moving them around. Each one uh, at given a different location will move in different directions. And that would immediately randomize them. That's what randomizes them. They are carried by velocity. They are in random locations. And being at random locations, they generate random velocity because the tails also move. So that's uh, that, uh, what's called zero modes, easy modes. You, you could move these vortex structures easily because they have long range tails contributing to velocity. That's a naive causative picture. It doesn't help to solve the problem, but that helps you understand what you are looking for. Uh, so, Famous mathematician Hopf outlined the general approach to the turbulence problem using the functional. His idea was that we don't really want to look at the specific solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, you are looking for the family of solutions. You have some random distribution like you have shaken it or stirred like James Bond and or maybe took a big spoon and stirred everything or maybe rotated them in different direction. You could do any things which create, pump in a lot of energy. You have uh, uh, this initial random conditions, and then uh, you let uh, the distribution of velocity evolve. And how you measure that? Uh, it's done by means of generating functional. You take velocity, multiply by source, integrate over volume, take an exponential, and that's uh, the characteristic or generating functional for the velocity field. And the beauty of that as noticed by Hoff is that you could derive some functional equation for Z uh, using Navier-Stokes equation for V. Uh, that's a rather standard procedure. You differentiate this exponential with this by time, substitute, well, this goes down from the exponential, then you substitute time derivative velocity by the right side and try to express every term in Navier-Stokes as functional derivative with respect to the source. And then you get equation of the structure, time derivative of Z is some operator, which in general depends both of the source and variational derivative of the source times Z. And that is uh, indeed wonderful thing, linear equation for nonlinear problem, but of course it's linear equation of the level of complexity higher than the level of complexity of ordinary differential equation because you have functional derivative of the spectral source, which depends on three dimensional uh, coordinates. So it's something which you could put on the wall, uh, you know, pray on that, but you cannot do anything with it. You pray on that, then you come back to your dirty models. So uh, that's what people thought about, um, about Hope equation. By the way, there is one exception. Uh, Yehot and Srinivasan 
uh, made a very interesting attempt to solve it. They had to make some model assumption at some point, but they considered the chain of Hopf equations for velocity field and using some uh, physics assumptions like uh, factorization of certain models and some assumption about, about pressure. Uh, they actually, they made some assumption about uh, you know, turbulent viscosity also, but then they arrived certain relations which allowed them to fit very well and explain the absurd multifractality. So Hopf equations make sense, but the, for mathematician or the theoretical physicist uh, of Landau school like me, the real problem is not to massage equation, but to actually solve it. Solve it in the sense that here is equation, here is solution, it equals to something, not approximately equals, but exactly equals. That's what I'm trying to do here. Not easy. The turbulence corresponds to the generate fixed point of the Navier-Stokes dynamics, the same way that Gibbs distribution is the generate fixed point of Newton dynamics. In case of Gibbs distribution, uh, it was done centuries ago and we are eternally grateful to Gibbs Boltzmann and Maxwell for discovering that basically they found the, how very complex Newtonian uh, dynamics of large number <coughs> of particles with unknown trajectories. You can't really follow how they move, but you say, forget it. They eventually will cover the energy surface because that's what solves the Hopf equation or Liouville equation uh, for a similar thing. And uh, it's called ergodic hypothesis. Mathematicians are still struggling to prove it, but physicists know it works. So Gibbs distribution is one solution of the Hopf equation. But in our case, we need another solution because uh, we are talking about Navier-Stokes, which doesn't conserve energy. So this Gibbs solution, unfortunately, or fortunately, will not work. We need to find substitute of Gibbs distribution. I will explain. Uh, I will explain. Oh, actually, I could explain it right now. Uh, you see, uh, this Gibbs distribution is degenerate because every point on energy surface uh, enters with uh, equal weight. It's not like one point on energy surface is solution. It's the whole surface is solution. So solution is has many, many parameters. Uh, velocities in, of every particle is a free parameter. You have sum of p squared over 2m, and that is the energy surface. So it's degenerate in rather trivial way. I mean, because energy surface is just a surface in phase space, and phase space is multidimensional, and surface is less than multidimensional, one dimension less. So we need to find the general solution here also, because we need to find the distribution. We don't want to find a solution. We need to find a family of solutions. And that such family solution is not a fixed point, but fixed manifold, degenerate so fixed point. Well, it's just this surface is trivial, just one dimensional, uh, I mean, D minus one dimensional manifold in D dimensions. Or Gibbs, for Gibbs. I'm going to present something. <laughs> I'm going to present to you replacement of Gibbs for turbulence, not for every turbulence. And I cannot guarantee that's unique solution because system is nonlinear. I found a solution with physical properties. So there are two ways of checking whether I found the correct solution. One way is to prove theorem that will take another hundred years. And another way is to investigate the consequences of, of this. Take it as a working hypothesis and try to solve and investigate the model and see whether that makes sense. That's what I'm trying to do now and we'll talk about that tomorrow. So the decay in turbulence is a degenerate fixed trajectory, slowly approaching the stable fixed point at zero velocity during due to the friction force presented by viscosity. So eventually, if you don't pump energy, you just stirred it in the beginning, eventually the fluid will stop, but if you pumped enough energy, it will take a long time, and maybe, perhaps, there will be some auto model, some universal regime in the end, uh, which would be a solution of that equation, and you would approach that regime for 
variety of initial data. Maybe there will be several solutions, like fixed points or fixed trajectories. There could be several because it's a nonlinear system. So I'm not claiming I found all of them, but I will show one of these fixed trajectories. So, um, Hoff equation for Navier-Stokes dynamic is compatible with such trajectory, but it's too general and too complex to compute anything. Um, its complexity is equivalent to the non-Gaussian functional integral displacing turbulence in the same category as critical phenomena in statistical physics. Placing or misplacing? Hmm? Placing or misplacing? Misplacing. So they all are misplacing. Yes, because it's much simpler. So it was uh, undeservably placed in the same category as critical phenomena in um, uh, statistical mechanics or critical uh, phenomena in Mm, quantum field theory, I claim it is much simpler. I, I thought it was field theory. I'm sorry for organizers, but I claim it is simpler. It is less than field theory. It's explicit solution. Why? You're, you're very happy with hmm? Yeah, okay. Well, look, I think, I, think I, I start annoying people by advertising, advertising, and not delivering. I will deliver. Uh, so, loop average uh, is a particular case of Hopf functional with the source uh, concentrated on a fixed loop in space. So take the source, which is integral over loop of delta function, three dimensional delta function of R minus C. So this source is zero everywhere except on the loop, and on the loop it is tangent direction of the loop times a delta function. So if you substitute such source uh, into this uh, Hopf integral, it will reduce to circulation by construction, of course. I design, designed this source so, so that um, this particular case of Hopf functional becomes exponential of some imaginary unit time circulation. And I will explain why imaginary unit. For gamma, C is circulation, is integral over the loop of velocity at the loop. Now, imaginary unit is not just because I like uh, uh, quantum mechanics, phase factors, and, and uh, gauge theories. It's because, uh, according to the measurements of distribution of, of the circulation by Sinivasan and uh, Eyer, uh, they measure that it's exponential. With exponential distribution, average exponential of gamma with real factor would diverge on the left or on the right. Only characteristic function, which is Fourier uh, uh, transform of the distribution, which is exactly what Wilson loop is, uh, uh, only the uh, exponential with imaginary <coughs> factor <coughs> will exist. And of course, you could also analytically continue that to real values, but that will be another story. So this is something which exists. And it is therefore a complex number. So my, uh, something which was not noted by, uh, by Hopf, but this Wilson loop average is not a real number. It's a complex number because circulation doesn't have symmetric distribution. The left and the right probabilities are different. Uh, sign uh, probability is not, not even function of gamma. So this thing is a complex number. This complex number by absolute value less than one, but it has imaginary part and that imaginary part is related to dissipation. So dissipation in this theory, exactly in the same way like in quantum mechanics is associated with complex conjugation. So this thing is like wave function and complex conjugation corresponds to time reversal. Which might be the equation pi that Say it again. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, I didn't want to talk too much about initial conditions, but yes. Uh, uh, at initial point, at time zero, you have a value of this thing corresponding to initial distribution of velocity field. You see, the definition of psi equals exponential of some integral related to V. For example, if you have Gaussian distribution of velocity at the initial moment, you could compute this uh, average 
and it will give you some uh, very well defined functional uh, of, uh, of the loop. If you integrate that with any Gaussian distribution, you will get the exponential of double integral of the loop times correlation function of velocity. So yes, initial value for psi is given by the initial data for V. You have initial distribution of velocity that provides initial value for this loop equation. Can, can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, perhaps you'll do it later, but what is the uh, definition of this expectation value? What is the measure? Yes, that's a very good question I was about to say. <clears throat> In the whole uh, Hopf approach, the expectation value is taken over initial values. At the time zero, there is some initial uh, velocity field. We're talking about, about decaying turbulence. So it was shaken, it was, uh, you know, energy was pumped. There was some crazy distribution of initial values. Don't have to be correct or something. But there is a lot of energy and it is some random field. It's not particular field, it's random field. Therefore, this exponential for the initial moment is not a single number like e to the i something, but it's something, um, you know, just in your head, Im imagine, taking Gaussian integral over Gaussian distribution of velocity. Those of you who have seen functional Gaussian functional integrals will understand that it will reduce to exponential of double integral of correlation of velocity. And therefore, that's very well-defined uh, initial distribution. Sasha, quick question uh, here. If uh, what is the symmetric, so should circulation, right? What is what? Vorticity is symmetric. The if you, the... if you uh, oh, open it, uh, yes, now I see your mouth. Yeah, vorticity is symmetric. The negative and positive uh, sides of the PDF. So the circulation should also be symmetric. Is that right? What is the solution for the, well, no, that no, will you... be the whole subject of my talk. What will be initial data? If you take a Gaussian uh, velocity field, uh, the initial, uh, I just described in my paper, uh, in my physics reports and in every paper um, about the subject, it's exponential of double integral over the loop of correlation function of velocity fields at two points. So it is very well defined functional of the loop. So, but the thing of course is to de uh, derive this analog of Hopf equation. Hopf equation uh, uh, is much more general. It, it has three-dimensional source. I have only one-dimensional source. My source is uh, this uh, loop C. So instead of, of the whole uh, three-dimensional field, I have one-dimensional. What's the miracle which allows me to derive closed equation? And this miracle is the property of Navier-Stokes. Not every nonlinear equation can be analyzed, but Navier-Stokes equation has a lot of hidden beauty and symmetry it's a vector field and it's uh, similar to gauge field. So in the same way as the loop equation was derived in gauge theory, it can be derived here. So you take time derivative of uh, this Wilson loop, this functional, and then you get, that's a very well known thing. What you have here in front of exponential is what is called, um, you know, theorem or something. It's just what you have, get when you differentiate circulation, you get integral over the loop, and then there will be only two terms. The third term, which is gradient of enthalpy, it will uh, uh, drop because it'll you have integral over the loop, closed loop in space of gradient of something. Uh, uh, such a integral is zero. So potential part drops, and that's very important. So when you get vorticity here, and vorticity times velocity here, but velocity, of course, can be expressed in terms of vorticity using Biot-Savart integral. So you get non-local expression, but that non-local expression will depend eventually of vorticity. Velocity expresses in terms of vorticity by Biot-Savart, and then you have three terms, each of one, two terms, each of them will depend on vorticity. So I will skip the mathematical details. What I claim happens is that this, these two terms can be represented as some operator, vector operator, acting on a loop. So you could 
um, so find some kind of variation of the uh, uh, loop which brings down vorticity, some other variation which down, brings down gradient, and then there will be third and fourth. One brings vorticity, another brings velocity. All these terms can be expressed in terms of um, functional derivative with respect to shape of the loop. And I can tell you in advance, that equation looks horrible. I derived it uh, in 93, and I looked at that since, and I couldn't, didn't know what to do with that. It was um, too singular, too uh, non-local. But then in mid 90s, I made a little breakthrough. Uh, I understood that it was, it simplifies, dramatically simplifies in momentum space. Why? Because this operator only depends on functional derivative. It does not depend on coordinate. In presence of Gaussian or any random forces, it would also, there will be also an extra term which depends on correlation function of sources, and that term would de depend on, on the coordinate and it will break that symmetry. When you have a Schrodinger equation with the operator only depending on derivatives and not depending on coordinates, you know what to do. You go to momentum space and then you will have algebraic system. So the beauty of this, that there is this special thing, translation invariant in loop space, it's exact property of Navier-Stokes equation, due to which the whole uh, equation becomes uh, not functional differential, but operator, uh, not operator, but uh, algebraic. And that's why it can be solved. So this independence translation invariant is the key to the solution. Before talking about the solution, I want to uh, uh, tell the following. This equation is equivalent to Schrodinger equation in loop space. Time derivative of wave function equals some operator applied to wave function. That's a Schrodinger equation. It's not equation in physical space. It's equation in loop space. The points in that space are closed loops and operators are changing shape of these loops. So it is a, Quantum mechanics in loop space, but still it is quantum mechanics. That's a miracle. Original equation was in three dimensions. It was nonlinear. And this is Schrodinger equation, which is linear, but it's equation in much higher space. So as it usually happens with nonlinear differential equation, you could solve it by going into very high, into higher dimension where they, there is some linear system and project from that system into this. And this, for example, it's called lax lax LA pair. So it's a simple, it's analogous example. I go to infinite dimensional space where equation is nonlinear, and I solve that, I mean linear, solve that linear equation, and then get back to three-dimensional space. So uh, excuse me, may I ask you one quick question? Yes, yes. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I can understand that if you're in the Euler limit then the loops retain their identity. But when you have viscosity, don't they just, some of them can disintegrate, no? Viscosity is finite here. Or there are I know, so the loops will, some will break. Loop some. is just the auxiliary object. It so is not, not assumed to be the what? infinitely thin vortex. It's just semantic analogy, forget it. Forget about a, a, a what singular vortices. This loop is not a vortex. It's a probe. It's what uh, Srini and, uh, and Kartik did. They've taken an arbitrary loop in space and you measure distribution of velocity by okay. finding uh, uh, this Wilson loop for arbitrary loop. Okay. But it's Fine. important to have all possible loops as a functional. Then by varying shape of that loop, you could find correlation functions and other things. So it's a, it's a just version of the hop functional. So this loop has nothing to do with physical objects in space. It's a probe. So, um, so here is how this uh, loop equation uh, looks. Time derivative. So the solution, uh, so this Schrodinger equation in loop space and what solution is, it's a plane wave in loop space. In, in ordinary, one dimensional, if I would have point like particles, I will have e to the i times uh, px. And instead of px, I have integral p dx. 
my x, my coordinate is the loop, and my momentum is p. So because there is no explicit dependence on the of the shape of the loop in the operator and only dependence on the functional derivatives and each functional derivative acting on this exponential will bring down p. So it's rather obvious that if you take such an ansatz and substitute in the loop equation, you will get algebraic equation for p. You will see that, uh, that this ansatz will solve the uh, loop equation if p satisfies the equation of its own. And uh, the Cauchy problem can be solved like that. You do functional Fourier transform, and you will find uh, you do, do functional Fourier transform with respect to the shape of the loop, and you will get um, uh, initial, initial value for distribution for the loop. I just skip that part. So if you know initial value for psi, you could functional Fourier transform and find an initial distribution for P. So it, for example, I, can, I did it in case of the uh, Gaussian field. Uh, if, if, if that can be done exactly. There is a famous solution of Navier-Stokes equation. We have a global constant rotation, uh, omega is constant, uh, velocity is linear. And uh, uh, if, if you take that om constant omega random Gaussian variable, that is an example of the exact solution of the Navier-Stokes. Uh, I mean, superposition of exact solutions. And when you do take that solutions, you could actually do all the transformation and find exactly what, uh, what function P corresponds to that. I found that it's also Gaussian and it has very specific, interesting, um, slowly decreasing Fourier coefficients. So I, on the circle, so this, a solvable problem once you know, for example, a Gaussian distribution. But of course, I'm not interested in uh, Gaussian solutions. I'm interested in fixed points in the fixed trajectory for that equation. So here is how this equation looks. Uh, those of you who are standing, please sit. And those who are sitting, please grab something because it's horrible. This equation is really horrible because it involves time derivative. That's OK. Uh, this delta p is not Laplacian, it's discontinuity. Um, so, uh, so it has discontinuity p squared here. So it has discontinuity here. And it also has discontinuity p in denominator, which means the continuity cannot be zero. That's a very interesting curve, which mm, have discontinuity at every point. And that's the whole. Um, so this equation looks so horrible, I didn't know how to solve it. And for 30 years, I was just uh, playing with it. And the simplest thing you could do, of course, with Schrodinger equation is WKB. I wrote WBK, of course, it means WKB. Uh, so WKB means that you assume that a uh, uh, solution is exponential uh, of some large phase, which is called classical action, and you could derive hamilton jacobi equation for that classical action, <clears throat> and you do that, I did that, and I derived what's called a real law. Turned out that this equation allows a synthetic solution at large, when loop is very large and in, in, encounters the higher area, so exponential of the area, actually arbitrary function of the area, uh, also could pass through that. It's exponential for other reasons. So it is function of minimal area. And there is exact argument which tells you that that has to be minimal area of the surface. The same argument, by the way, applies to Wilson loop in, in a QCD. If you have solution which is a function of a surface, the only minimal surface there could, could be is minimal surface. Why? Because uh, the it's called Bianchi, Bianchi identity. If you have exponential of circulation of vector field, then um, if it is equivalent to some surface, you could derive um, what's called Bianchi identity for uh, uh, vector field. Uh, uh, in our case, that Bianchi identity means that uh, vorticity is divergenceless. So that divergenceless uh, translates into uh, what is called plateau equation for the surface. So it's exact statement that if there is a single surface, that surface must be a minimal surface. So all that was derived, was confirmed by um, 
by Srini and Kartik in very remarkable experiments, which inspired me to come back to the subject because I was thinking that the whole thing will be buried forever, but Srini was persistent and managed to make this record scale experiment with Kartik. And they found out indeed there is area law. Then later they improved that, they uh, found a specific exponential tail, which also agrees with predictions. And then the other thing was uh, uh, the, uh, the low square root of area, which was recently verified by Kartik and also today uh, uh, Luca described some model which presents uh, similar behavior of square root of area uh, for the circulation. So circulation distribution is more or less studied both experimentally and theoretically as, as asymptotic solution of the loop equation for large loops. So loop equation may sound very exotic, but it actually works. So it works in, in, in BCD, it works in abelian theory, and it works in, in, in case of turbulence where it produces predictable non-perturbative results regarding intermittency. Now let's try to actually solve this equation because it turns out that this equation can be solved analytically. And I'm not claiming that it's the only possible solution, but when you are talking of lions, as one famous lion hunter said, zero is a lot. So more than zero is more than a lot. So that's the only known solution so far. So let's look at that and see what are these consequences and whether that makes sense for the physicist. So here is how this solution looks. First of all, this solution. You will have it in a minute. That is angle parameter on the loop. Each loop can be described by arbitrary parameter theta varying from zero to one or from zero to pi. It's parametric invariant. Uh, so uh, the first remarkable thing is that time enters in a very trivial way. It's one over square root of time. Why? It's actually totally obvious why. It's obvious why, because this equation um, has very simple structure. Left side is time derivative of P and the right side scales of P cube. Every term is a homogeneous function of P of the scale of P cube. That's P cube, this is P cube, uh, this ratio is P squared times this delta P is also P cube. So the whole right side is P cube. If you have the equation that time derivative of something equals this something cubed, then solution <coughs> is obvious. There is only one possible solution, one over square root of time plus constant. So that's, that's first surprise. That was easy. This is much less trivial. This thing, this thing is the heart of the matter. This solution uh, for these vectors fk, um, uh, I have to tell you that I approximate the curve as a polygon. I take large number of points and, uh, and assume that the curve is piecewise constant. So these are uh, values of this polygon at the vertices. And then I tend to infinity the number of vertices and that will be final solution. So uh, approximate solution is a curve by a polygon and then I tend to infinity the number of vertices. So uh, fk are values of f at equidistant places on the circle and uh, here is something which solves that nonlinear equation. I mean there is very little I can add to that because you have to actually go into that algebra, or you could take my notebooks. I did everything in Mathematica, of course, and I published my notebook, so you could check my calculations how that thing solves that equation. So this is a solution. So this alphas 
are related to variable sigma, suddenly we get uh, sigma which are arbitrary. Arbitrary means random. In general, sigma could take uh, at every link of that polygon, uh, this step sigma could be plus minus one. So, uh, and uh, so it's like Ising model, but in addition to Ising model, it's Ising model coupled to rational number because this beta P over Q is rational number. It's not uh, some continuous number. Why rational? Because if it is not rational, the curve would not close. Uh, it has to close after, you see, you have to have the following property that this angle alpha at the end next to the last, uh, it has to be close. So alpha n equals alpha zero. And that means condition on beta. It can only be uh, closed because sigmas are plus minus one. So the not sum of sigmas is some integer. So the only solution would be rational p over q and integer r. So uh, that's the most general set of solutions of these equations. And the fact that rational numbers appear uh, follows from the analogy with quantum mechanics. It's, I'm solving quantum mechanical system, and when I'm solving a quantum mechanical one-dimensional system, of course, I'm, I impose periodicity conditions, and in quantum mechanics, periodicity conditions lead to quantization. That's as old as 100 years. So that's uh, what happens here. It's exact equivalence to Schrodinger equation in loop space. Periodicity in loop space leads to quantization, and suddenly we are in the re realm of the uh, number theory, because now we are, have to, mm, you know, have to investigate this ensemble. We have uh, this arbitrary rotation matrix, which is not important. We have number of points, P, Q, R, and these sigmas. These are all random numbers. I call this ensemble of numbers, Euler ensemble, because the Euler, you know, a few hundred years ago, found that the way to count all fractions, it's called Euler torsions, the number of possible fractions I was given denominator. So number of all P, which are co-prime with Q, is known as called Euler torsion. And that is how the number theory enters the game. Okay, so it's not a toy model like one dimensional Berger's equation. It's exact stochastic solution of 3D Navier-Stokes equation. I am not uh, uh, guessing here. I am not, mm, uh, you know, approximating or modeling and trying to guess something which should be hopefully uh, in the same symmetry class. I'm just solving nonlinear equation for P, which are one-to-one -one correspondence in Navier terms of Navier-Stokes. And I found the most general solution, which is this. Of course, not, not unique. I don't know whether it could be another one. So here is the partition function of this system. You should sum over possible uh, values of sigma. That's combinatorial factor. Uh, that's a very well known counting factor, how many spins there are with given sum. That's the combinatorial factor. And the rest is just number of terms. I assume, of course, that every uh, representative, every mm, member of this set of Euler ensemble enters with equal weight. I don't fantasize here. I'm just saying that it's a mathematical object and it's analog of ergodic theorem. I cover my object, which is discrete set, with unit weight. So if you do that, you'll get these weights phi of q, which are Euler torsions, which count number of fractions. And you could compute the sum asymptotically at large n or at small mu. You could sum over n also with chemical potential. And you get very specific answer. It was recently con confirmed by the number theorists who grabbed my Euler ensemble. We're very happy that finally number theory is used in turbulence and they I computed this, I computed other things and corrected my, I mean, 
improve my estimates of some things. So you could also compute the entropy, which is more interesting, right? You could, you could take uh, average of omega squared, square of vorticity, times t squared, because there is a t squared in denominator, and that will be the universal number uh, which I computed. So here is this number. So this, um, this uh, theory gives the following formula for energy decay. It's one over t squared. And I know, I know that there are different values of time index for decay observed. Maybe there are different uh, universality classes like Grisha and I discussed. Maybe there are uh, not precise experiments. Anyway, in my solution, there is no room for any um, ambiguity. It's one over t squared purely by dimension counting because omega has dimension one over t for the fact, of course, it's one over t squared. So it is one over t squared and the coefficient is calculable. You could also compute vorticity moments, which is also interesting. Uh, and they are given by some horrible formula that all follows from number theory. Uh, but, um, you know, calculable, involves zeta function, involves zeta function of even integer, which is uh, elementary, and uh, of odd integer, which is not elementary. And then uh, the most remarkable property of this system is that, in fact, it is less than one dimension. It's even simpler than that. Because the whole thing is a Markov process. You could, if you consider points in a circle, you, you could say that probability for the next point, to next spin sigma to be plus or minus one, uh, only depends on the number of remaining uh, uh, sigmas uh, on a circle, and uh, uh, because their sum of is, um, is um, known, so it depends on two parameters of, of uh, number of ones and number of minus ones. And uh, uh, the probability, so there is two parameters, and plus and then minus, and probability that n plus goes to n plus minus one is this, and probability of uh, n minus going to n minus minus one is this. There is no other possibility. One of them will diminish. So that step of the Markov chain corresponds to sigma equals one, and that corresponds to sigma equals minus one. And that means that it is not one dimensional system. It's two parameter system. You just have random walk. And when you generate it on a computer, you don't have to remember anything. You remember two numbers. And we have, that's how we implemented it. We have uh, O of n to the zero memory in the computer, and therefore we could simulate astronomically large systems. We could, we took 200 million just because that was easy enough on our modest uh, Abu Dhabi supercomputer. But uh, on a big supercomputer, as I hope we will do with Kartik and Srini, uh, uh, it will, Maybe we could take several billion. When you have a billion points, then your statistical errors are invisible. You don't see them on a plot. You have as good as analytic solution. So that's what we did, and I will describe results tomorrow. They are very interesting and controversial. And uh, let me give the tastiest part of my dish uh, tomorrow. So um, uh, here is another interesting property. Do I have a few more minutes? Actually, I am the last to speak. So uh, anybody could leave no, when. The war will continue after this, right? <laughs> yeah, look, as long as there will be one person left, and I'm looking at you, Grisha, <laughs> as long as there will be one person left, I, keep, I will keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, no, no, it will be the last piece of information. Here is the most important, I would say. What we usually do when we have a fixed point, mm -hmm. or we have in normalization group fixed point or fixed point, 
in nonlinear equation with steady stability. We find small perturbation near this fixed point, and usually we get exponentially small corrections, and these exponentially small corrections are described by Laponov index. In the case of anomalous dimensions, uh, that was anomalous dimensions of operators because uh, remolization group equations went in logarithm of, um, of the scale, and there were futile, futile, how to say, uh, hopeless attempts to do the same uh, with uh, beyond perturbation theory in turbulence. I'm sorry to say so, guys. I'm one of the fathers of the uh, remolization group equations. It does not work in turbulence. It cannot work because there is no uh, locality. How do you get remolization group equation? You have local Gibbs distribution, right? At, at a macroscopic atomic scale, then you integrate out degrees of freedom one by after another. And each time your new effective Lagrangian is a function of the previous one. That's how you get non-perturbative remolization group here because of pressure because of non-locality, because of velocity, which is dependent on the whole space. There is no locality and there is no effective. First, first of all, there is no Gibbs distribution to start with. We don't have uh, exponential of something, average over something, we don't have, we have to derive it. So the remolization group is not given, it has to be derived. So here is what I do have. I have, uh, when I find uh, perturbation, uh, per when I look for perturbation of my solution of the loop equation, turns out that they are not exponential, they are power-like. Why? Because, because the basic solution was not constant. The basic solution has explicit shape. It was one over square root of time. Now, linearized operator for perturbation would be quadratic in that uh, 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 fixed point solution. Therefore, this linearized operator would scale as one over time. So derivative of, of the, the uh, uh, perturbation will be one over time times some operator applied to perturbation. That means the solution is a power, not exponential. So get ex so the, it's exact. So there is exact spectrum of anomalous dimension. Scale invariance came for free from this equation without any hypothesis about normalization group. It's just a property of equation. It's a fixed point such, actually it's a fixed trajectory such that when you perturb it, the, oops, uh, the perturbation, the perturbation uh, decays not as exponential, but as a power. And then we have explicit, very explicit equation uh, for this spectrum of these dimensions. It can be written very in a very explicit way as a sum determinant of some huge polynomial uh, as a function of this fk, which I solved before. So it's some analytic expression. Unlike, that's why I said that this is simpler than field theory. In the conformal bootstrap, it's the biggest unsolved problem to analytically find, uh, uh, you know, anomalous dimensions, they are doing it numerically with huge, uh, you know, minimis optimization uh, in constrained optimization, et cetera, et cetera. Here you have analytic expression and uh, it's only the problem to tend and to infinity. That's a big problem, but that's a mathematical problem. That's not a problem to pray to God to give you help. You can do it. So that is how it works. Now, uh, let me summarize. So our solution for the loop average in decaying turbulence shows non-perturbative effects, which are missing in weak turbulence, particularly the quantization of parameters. So if you expand, if you add random forces and you expand everything in terms of uh, uh, random forces or in terms of nonlinearities, which is the same, and then you're supposedly to turn off random forces to get <laughs> decaying turbulence, and then you should get some infinite enhancement of that. You never really do that. Uh, and you cannot do it, actually. You don't see that spontaneous effect in the ordinary approach with forces, because you don't know why the turbulence will stay when it turns the forces to zero. So in ordinary approach, you don't see anything quantized. You, hear, you assume continuous spectrum, and you get continuous spectrum. But you kind of even enforce it. 
You see, what you should do, you should solve Navier Stokes equation without any forcing and see what spontaneous stochasticity arises there. Here is this spontaneous stochasticity, and it is discrete, not continuous. And uh, so these quantum effects follow from mathematical equivalence of Navier Stokes statistics to quantum mechanics and loop space. So this equivalence is not assumption, this equivalence is not approximation or model, it is exact property. It's just something which was never noticed about Hopf equation, but here we actually made it work. Uh, so it is analogy with quantum mechanics. So the quantum statistical system corresponding to the solution of the Schrodinger equation in loose space can be regarded as dual to the turbulence velocity field. In the same sense as quantum gravity is dual to the gauge theory in ADS CFT correspondence. Correlation functions coincide and dynamics different. Dynamics are very different. Let me elaborate that idea a little bit. In the ordinary view of velocity field in turbulence, velocity is full of vortex structures, randomly, like I said in the beginning, randomly distributed in space. And these structures make uh, local velocity or local vorticity a stochastic variable. Because if you, for example, take a circulation around some fixed loop in space with some probability like Luca Mariconi described, uh, there will be vortex structure passing through that uh, loop and uh, that would make that loop a, stochastic loop a stochastic variable. If loop is large enough, that would be self-averaging, but if it is small, it's uh, strongly fluctuating stochastic variable. Now, that's ordinary picture. In our picture, uh, we don't have physical space. We have auxiliary space. We have this momentum loop, P of theta. Now, what uh, property of this loop corresponds to uh, the vorticity to, to, to the, uh, you know, the singular vorticity, discontinuity. Turns out that disc every discontinuity of the uh, momentum loop, which is described by these sigma variables, corresponds to vorticity. There is one-to-one -one correspondence. Vorticity, actually, local vorticity at the place of the loop equals cross product of momentum P times delta P. So, cross product of P and delta P basically is proportional to vorticity. So non-trivial distribution of this delta P, which is this spins of Eisen model, this non-trivial distribution corresponds to non-trivial distribution of vorticity. So I get statistics uh, of the correlation functions and everything for the uh, ordinary uh, field velocity field and vorticity field, etc., expressed in terms of the uh, Wilson loop. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about very specific formulas which arise when I compute basic quantities in, uh, in decaying terminals, namely vorticity correlation and uh, uh, energy spectrum. They can be expressed in terms of the slope function. And uh, not now. Oh, I didn't say uh, final word. Compared to other critical phenomena, phenomena, this theory is quite simple. It's not a field theory, but quantum statistical system is amorphous to periodic Markov process to integer variables. The spectrum of unknowledge dimensions presents formidable problem in conformable stuff. Still, spectral equation in this theory is explicitly calculable. Uh, and uh, that is, uh, okay. We already uploaded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a couple of questions. The first one is that hi. Oh, I don't hear well, so I have to <laughs> okay. see you a little. Yes. Uh, the loop that you considered is a simple loop or it can intersect? And it work? is a functional. So the loop could be uh, uh, self intersecting in, in three dimensions, typical loop don't self intersect. But it is not regular. It has. It could be arbitrary. It could consist of several uh, 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 loops. You see, but my definition of loop is a periodic vector function. It's a function with such that C of theta plus two pi equals C of theta. It could intersect itself. It could consist of two 
different pieces, it means it is, has some period, double period. I see, so all those loops are... I have to find solution as a function of all possible loops, yes. not for particular loops. I understand. Uh, second question is, what about uh, if you put this fluid in a, or, you know, in a box, what about the boundary conditions in this? Boundary conditions? Yes. The there are two space. boundary conditions. Uh, one boundary condition is when the loop shrinks to a point, you have to have psi right. equal one. Right. And uh, another boundary condition, of course, is that um, when loop goes to infinity, when it's covering large uh, uh, area, it goes to zero. Just one last question. If you don't yeah. Mind. yeah. Uh, you know, I didn't get the answer about the, the measure, actually. These averages are Gaussian averages, or, I mean, uh, how... Measure? You no, know, the, you're always writing averages, right? So it's... Uh, no, 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 no. You didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I found solution, and, and this solution is averaged over my ensemble. See, initially, initially it was averaged. How, this how it works. I have some family of, of, of solutions with different initial conditions. They approach the fixed point, yes. and then they cover that fixed manifold. So regardless, initial boundary condition, as long as it's in some class, I'll have the uniform, like Gibbs energy. The independent of, of energy, initial data, I will cover the energy surface. So here, independently of initial data, I will cover my manifold with unit weight. That's what I assume. Luca. So, uh, Sasha, if I understood it correctly, you have a, a loop which has been discretized into capital N points, right? Yes. So, uh, uh, I mean, I would be inclined to take N a large value, so I would take like large N limit, but you have a, you have some, uh, your partition function considers all the, the capital N values. Uh, what's this? So, you're considering polygonal uh, loops and an ensemble of polygonal uh, loops. Uh, well, at given n, there is two to the n possibilities for sigmas, right. and I have to honestly sum. It's it's like problem of Ising model. You have to solve the Ising model, and then you have to go statistical limit when n goes to infinity. I will describe that tomorrow. It's a non-trivial problem, but it can be, well at least it can be done on computer. It 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 it. it. It resembles a little bit the lattice gas approach to, to, to phase transition sometimes. It's not lattice. In the lattice, you have 30,000 cubed. Right. Here I have 20, 100 million, okay. 200 million. Yeah. So my lattice spacing is 10 to the minus 9. Okay. So I could go to zero. All right. You see, I have one dimensional system. The miracle is that I have one dimensional statistical system describing the three-dimensional turbulence. And moreover, this one-dimensional system, in fact, is less than one-dimensional because I don't have to store all the data in memory. Uh, hi, uh, here at the back. Uh, yeah, could you perhaps indicate- Get closer, I oh. don't hear very well. I'll come there. <laughs> Uh, could you perhaps indicate what is so special about uh, three dimensions or can this be extended to any higher yes, dimensions? Maybe? That's a very good question. Thank you. First of all, it doesn't exist in two and one dimension. It, solution exists only starting from three dimensions because it can keep pure kinematically. Now, I in my paper, I found solution for arbitrary dimension and uh, it involves some more degrees of freedom. So it Three, di uh, three dimension is a minimal dimension when that solution exists. And that solution has, uh, uh, you know, plus minus one variables at each link. In case of higher dimension, it will be some uh, uh, unit vectors associated with each link. Uh, but the form is the same? The form of the solution is the same? Yes. Well, I don't know if that's the most general. I found the general set of solution generalizing this one where in higher dimensions, each link would correspond to unit vector on a sphere of dimension d minus three. So at d equals three, it is plus minus one. S d minus three, S zero is z, plus minus one. All right, thanks. Yeah. Rahul, uh, here, is it possible to go back to equation 28 in your talk? Uh, yes. 
Uh, what equation? 28, because I didn't see page numbers. Uh, yes, here, 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 here. So 25. <laughs> 25. So uh, that's an equation for the derivative of the energy, or it's an equation for the energy itself? That's, that's a, uh, uh, no, that's no, 25, you mean? Yes, 25. 25 is time derivative of energy, which means energy decays as 1 over t. In the experiments, uh, it decays in the power 1 over t to some power, and that power varied between experiments from 1 to 1 and a half, and 1.5. And maybe, just maybe, there are classes of universality. I mean, there maybe are. my class is 1 over t. Maybe. There are other classes, I don't know that. Or maybe there is something which depends on initial data. We don't want to study effects which depend on initial data, really. We want no, to but study have universal to. If effects. it is a decaying energy problem, it will depend on initial data. So I think uh, you will have to worry about that. I mean, I can give you any number of initial conditions which lead to different power law decays of the energy. Please repeat. Yes, asymptotically. Yeah, you will start with an energy spectrum which goes as k to the. No, no, I would like power. to hear the question. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so I'm saying that uh, for different initial data, you can get different power law decays of the energy. It could be that there are several fixed points of this right. uh, Hopf equation, and they just found one of them. And maybe for some initial data, you, uh, the solution would end up in one fixed point. By fixed point, I mean fixed trajectory. It, it's uh, yeah. fixed trajectory meaning universal dependence of time. So there are several regimes which are self-consistent with obvious talks. I found one. Okay, so, I don't claim it's the only one. Also, you, you said that in, in your next lecture, you will give us the energy spectrum as a function of time. Which I will... have a unique function of time. I don't have any freedom in Function okay, of anyway, we will talk uh, when you give us this. Yes, my, my function of time is 1 over t, and that follows from equation. I have no room for uh, uh, ambiguity here. Um, maybe I could uh, elaborate a bit on the, uh, the question that Rahul asked. Um, so John, uh, uh, P. John, who is somewhere, and I, when he was my postdoc, we tried to do the exercise that you mentioned. It is in the volume dedicated to Uriel Frisch. Um, so you have a box, um, and then you uh, initialize with some energy input into small number of modes at large modes. And then you uh, sort of let it go according to Navier-Stokes and try to find out um, what kind of exponents lead uh, result uh, for the decay of energy? Just the same as you were talking about. Now, uh, Sasha showed one example where the vorticity goes like t to the minus two or something, I think. I think there are three solutions that are known. One is what he just showed, which is for the case when the decay is self-similar. And another one relating to the initial spectrum, which has k to the power uh, 2, and another one k to the power 4, which you are implying. And they give you uh, t to the power minus uh, 2.4 in one case, 2.2 in uh, another case. And we try to see, are there initial conditions which uh, will a priori or a posteriori uh, allow you to uh, see to which of these exponents you converge eventually? but it is very difficult to do. All I can tell you is that initial conditions, they start out in some way, but most of them seem to converge to a vorticity um, square going like t to the power minus 2.2. This is the birkhoff safman invariant case. Um, but minus two is not a favored thing. Minus 2.4 is also not favored even though, as you pointed out uh, from our own data, um, you can get any, any exponent you like, more or less, but there are three of them to which uh, things converge, or, uh, more or less. But I think the, uh, the propensity is to go to 2.2, not to 2. 
We should talk about that. I, I yes. do, maybe you have you have a possibility. This is not a unique solution, as you have pointed out yourself. Well, uh, I would give some chance that you see uh, this thing. Uh, the only way out of this simple dimensional counting, because what I say is basically omega has dimension of one over t, omega squared has dimension of one over t squared, and that's it. But but. We really don't want exactly coinciding point. We would like to have something separated by the distance, and then we want that distance going to zero. And inside inertial interval, we'll get some singular power, perhaps. That is something which I would understand. And when I was deriving correlation function, because more complete answer to your question, we derived for me correlation function, omega of zero, omega of r is a function of r then, or equivalently in momentum space, in the wavelength space, the spectrum, right? Integral over the spectrum should give you the dissipation. So I'm computing that and, well, I computed that and I'm going to report tomorrow a solution I found. Maybe there is other solution because I found something which uh, confirms this one over t squared. But uh, uh, within the framework, there are possibilities for more complex solutions with non-trivial indices. Any other questions? Okay, one over there. Hi. Uh, so you said your solution might not be unique. But if I start out with Navier-Stokes, uh, uh, you said the solution you found. Sorry, you said the solution you found might not be unique. But if I start out with Navier-Stokes with some given initial condition and given boundary condition, the solution is unique. So does that mean your the, your model only admits some specific initial no, no, conditions? No. I didn't solve Navier-Stokes equations in interdimensional box. I solved equation for my uh, fixed point. I mean, I took my solution, it still has random variables. What I did, I found uh, the simulated average over that value. So I, my solution is not complete because it remains some random variables. So in my solution, I have to average over this variable sigma equals plus minus one. And that's a formidable task, though infinitely simpler than three-dimensional turbulence. It's like one dimensional Ising model, but you have to do it. That's what I was doing. So uh, what what would go different if uh, there is a solution which does not obey your average quantities predicted from the model? Like well, where is the degree of freedom in the I can U? only prove it one way. I can prove that my solution solves Navier-Stokes equation. Okay. So you are telling me you solve Navier-Stokes equation. Why do you solve, find only one solution? I am stupid. I only could found one. I'm not saying that. I'm saying where is the possibility of having different solutions? Maybe there are. Maybe. Look, like I said, there are two ways of finding out. One, to prove a theorem. And that may take 100 years or 200 years for mathematicians because they still haven't proven ergodic theory. So uh, another way is a physicist way, is to investigate, take it as a working hypothesis, investigate the properties, and check whether they make uh, sense uh, consistently. First of all, you have to check whether they are logically consistent, where they have contradict any principles, and then you have to compare with experiments, of course. So that's the only way we can do it. So I actually urge those of you who um, have a lot of ambitions, a lot of skills, and not much uh, to do, uh, to jump into this feast and finish the theory of turbulence. I didn't, I don't claim I finished it. I just found something and maybe this fish is too big for me. Help me reel it out. Thank you. Okay, uh, so on that fishing note, uh, we end and uh, we uh, uh, can go out and have high tea. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sasha, for a very stimulating lecture.